another main challenge we are facing here is the accurate information from the weather forecast because sometimes they tell us there is going to be this much of rain and we waited for those days they are saying while well, else you find is not raining at all and when they say this amount much amount of rain is going to rain also you find is very minimal sometimes they say it's going to rain a very little rainfall you find that a very heavy downpour flooding and uh, it destroy all our crops we get um, a lot of rains from Dakaine, is it Dakaine? <coughs> they, they, they are overflow, like comes right al along our, our chambers and it floods. Mm -hmm. There's something that can be done about the overflow. The, the water, like a little at a time, because once, once they release the water, I'm, I'm not joking, like two weeks, I, I don't farm because it's flooded. Mm -hmm. And if I have planted anything on the farm, it just rot because of... Wow because of uh, water logging, so yeah. As, as one of the Nini, the farmers have said, eh? sometimes even if they say, it doesn't come. The climate is unreliable and unpredictable, but at least farmers could know when they can plant and when they, the rains will come and when they can do other activities. But at the moment, the, the reliability is not uh, as, uh, has a problem because they cannot know when the rains will start. The cessation and the onset have shifted so much, they are not reliable. The farmers cannot know when to start planting. They cannot rely completely on the rainfall. The rainfall sometimes is slow. it comes and then disappears. So that time there's a prolonged drought period, the crops fail, and the productivity has gone down because of those changes in rainfall. I think our role, once we understand these questions, is to try to come up with the right solutions that are built for farmers here. Parts of it is really just about communication, right? How can we really clearly explain what the forecast says to the farmer in the context of their specific farm, their specific crop, their specific, you know, topography? for them to be able to make decisions, right? That's a big part of it. Obviously there is the science part and how we can improve the forecast itself, but I think a lot of it is really just understanding the, the dynamics of their day-to-day -day work and where we can be hopefully uh, helpful. All right, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody. Welcome to the Tomorrow Now session. My name is Georgina Campbell Flatter, the Executive Director of TomorrowNow.org, and I am joined by my good friend Neil Hausman from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And I'm really excited about the conversation today. We're going to touch on a number of different themes that really connect climate adaptation, food insecurity, and action. Now we're joining you from the beautiful city of Nairobi, Kenya, and so hopefully we'll be able to share some of the stories and learnings from our recent trip. Now before we jump into the, the conversation, I did want to just share a little bit about Tomorrow Now, who we are and what our purpose is. We were founded to address the urgent need to adapt, act and prepare to our changing climate now three words to describe our purpose. Urgency, opportunity, and sustainability. Urgency. The consequences of climate change are unfolding now. Those who are most impacted, most at risk, are least equipped to adapt and act. Opportunity. And tomorrow now is all about opportunity and hope. There are some phenomenal technologies, advanced technologies and innovations that can help address problems today. And sustainability. We need to think differently about how we address these challenges, how we work together, and how we implement solutions for the long term. And not just today and the now, but also for tomorrow. So these three themes, urgency, opportunity, sustainability, they set the stage for the rest of our conversation. So let's jump in. So let me introduce Neil. 
uh, who's joining us from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Neil is a senior program officer. He has a very exciting mandate, an exciting portfolio of investments, and we're very excited to, to learn more. So uh, let's dive in. So Neil, with that, I would love for you to share with our audience a little bit about yourself and a little bit about your background, why you joined the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, but also about your approach to investments. Sure. And first, uh, thank you very much for having me. It's great, a great opportunity to, to chat about the, uh, the, the urgent need for climate adaptation. I joined the Gates Foundation about two years ago, brought on as part of our cl climate adaptation por portfolio as we built it out. And so uh, coming from a, a, a career at Corteva AgriScience and, and Pioneer Hybrid, where I was working in industry to develop uh, initially drought tolerant maize hybrids. So kind of been working in the area of climate adaptation my whole career and uh, saw just an, a, a great opportunity at the Gates Foundation to, to drive uh, those solutions and provide tools for smallholder farmers uh, and, and uh, you know, address this extremely urgent need. And I felt in, in some ways that this is, this is the challenge of, of, our, of our times right now. And in some ways, it's not a, it, I don't really have a choice. I, I have to act now. And all of the, you know, uh, the privilege that I have, all of the opportunities I've had to build in my career, it's the time to give back and to, uh, and to make the changes that are really necessary. So for me, it was in some ways uh, a hard, a very hard uh, opportunity to pass up. So I just, just grabbed it. So I'm really excited to now be building a portfolio and working, working with you guys to uh, provide tools for smallholder farmers. So I want to focus on the big picture for a moment and talk about the importance of what we can do right now and the urgency. So could you share from your perspective, what does the climate adaptation challenge mean to you, especially in the context of Africa? Coming from a you know, high income country scenario and with my expertise, there's only so much I can know. And so one of the very important aspects of our portfolio is humility and willingness to listen. So that's part of why I'm here in Nairobi today is, is to continue to understand and, and the, which tools will be necessary, the solutions that will be valuable, but more, more important than that, the, the problems that smallholders are facing. And so over the last few days and in our visits, as well as uh, in previous discussions, just understanding the, the really hard decisions that smallholder farmers make all the time. And it's, it's difficult from a high income country perspective to, to relate uh, because, uh, because of the buffers that we have in dealing with risk that the smallholder farmers just don't have access to. So things like uh, insurance, where in case something fails, we have backups. If someone, our house burns down, we have ways to start over. Smallholder farmers don't have those buffers. And so, for example, when they're making a decision about which variety to plant or which, you know, whether to purchase fertilizer, whether to dig a, uh, dig a ditch to manage uh, water runoff, those are critical, hard decisions that have huge impacts for their families. And uh, so in that context, a, you know, uncertainty about the weather changes in what changes in the practices that they need to apply from what they've traditionally applied. Uh, they're extremely hard decisions, and so really, where we where we come from is providing tools and a suite of potential solutions from which they can draw to make decisions for themselves. Definitely, for our from our perspective, it makes no sense for me to try to channel my inner smallholder farmer and. and come up with solutions to their problems, but more provide them options. And that's what we do in, through our investments, especially I work more in the early stage R&D work where we're providing and de-risking technologies, uh, uh, especially taking things that are applied in high income country scenarios, like the uh, analytics and, uh, and, and solutions from tomorrow.io, and then applying those, adapting and adopting those for uh, low and middle income country scenarios. So one of the themes that I want to 
draw out in this conversation is the connection between climate adaptation and food insecurity. During this trip, you mentioned we spent a lot of time with farmers and, and also uh, climate scientists and government agencies. And you know, has have those conversations made you think differently about the problem uh, that we're trying to address here? I think what it's reinforced in me during these discussions has been the need for and a very difficult this, you know, opportunity to bring the communities together, right? No, a government agency cannot work independently from the, the private sector. Uh, philanthropy cannot work independently from academia. We do really need to pull together and bring all the solutions we have and develop products that are scalable and sustainable for smallholder farmers. We, we have a, there's an extreme need and it's, it's difficult work. It's, people work in their, their kind of silos, their approaches, they have long careers in those, in those areas. And so it's, sometimes we don't even speak the same technical language. We don't, we don't approach things in the same way. And so bringing together, listening, and then, and then you know, focusing on the need for solutions that really brings us together. And so, uh, you know, following on from that, that point and, and solutions and opportunity and, and hope, which is what Tomorrow Now is, is all about. In Bill's recent book, he talks about how we're going to have about 10 billion people on our planet by 2050, and that we must increase food production by 70%. And it sounds like there's a lot of work to do between now and then uh, to reach that goal. When you hear statistics like that, it can be a little scary, mm -hmm. right? But as I said, this panel and, and the work that we're doing, it's all about opportunity and hope. So could you maybe speak to some of the areas that um, you're working in that are helping to accelerate progress and, and change in the food security space and maybe touch on some specific projects that you're leading. And so one of the areas, and this actually came up in our recent discussions with the farmers, is in crop selection and crop choice, right? So if you're, if you're a farmer who's been grown maize for the past two seasons and seeing your yields decreasing, seal had failed harvests, you're pretty desperate for tools to help you decide, given climate uncertainty, given what we know about how a rainy season might roll out, what crop should I plant? And you can imagine, especially if you've had failures in the past, that's a very, very hard decision to make because it's a risk to continue what you did before, and it's a risk to change something, to do something new. And so one of the, uh, you know, one of the, the, the tools that we're building is to help farmers decide which crop makes sense given new climate uncertainties for their, for their operations. And also after crop, which variety of, of the menu that might be available, which variety might work best for them? Short season, long season, how do those play out with stresses like drought or high temperatures versus new pests, new diseases that they might be experiencing. So helping provide them tools, but also I think the importance of, of predictive tools, right? So one of the major challenges with climate change is that the past does not predict the future. What may have been expect a rainy season to start in March, it may now start in April or May and be much shortened. So you can't just rely on what you knew, you can't rely on almost anything. And so but even from an analytics perspective, you're training models for an uncertain future, which is really hard, technically very difficult. You can't just collect data in the past and then average it and, and use that looking forward. And so across a number of investments, we're looking at development and training and validation of predictive models to help farmers make a, a, a better decision and a risk balanced decision for their operation. And it sounds like your investment portfolio, you're working with a number of different stakeholders, academia, the private sector, you're engaging the, the public sector and, and NGOs. So how do, you, how do you think about that in the context of food security, seed breeding, 
um, R&D versus operational services. How do you think about that portfolio of stakeholders? As I described in the short intro, I'm coming from an in industry background. We're always working in R&D, but having connections to product development and product release. And so that's the way I approach my our investment portfolio is to try to think very critically about products. What product are we de developing for which customer and be very specific on that. And also think through product deployment, right? Scalable, sustainable solutions. And, you know, there, there's, a, there's a risk in trying to develop just new technical solutions of not being specific enough, not choosing the right use case to really develop something that can be deployed quickly. And as we talked about previously, we need to develop products and services now for real problems today. So we can't afford to make a lot of mistakes or wander around in the wilderness or develop something that doesn't have utility. So really a very product focused mentality and a, a drive to learn and to develop something with, with your customer as part of the engagement. And so that's one of the reasons we're really excited about the work with Tomorrow Now is that you're an impact focused organization as a 501c3, but also tomorrow.io where there's deep, um, deep knowledge of product, deep knowledge of and R and D solutions for analytics and data. And so I think it's a, it's a nice partnership. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I remember when we uh, first met and one of the main points you, you made to me is look, we need to uh, see things differently. We need to do things differently. Um, and you've touched on it a little bit in, in your comments so far, but maybe um, could you help me unpack that statement uh, in the context of maybe technologies, uh, investments, and also partnership? No one party can do this alone, right? So from a private, uh, a private enterprise perspective, it, to make impact and to deploy in, for smallholder farmers where their main contact may be with an extension agent from the government you're not going to get traction, you're not going to have strong impact if you go alone without, without involving government services and uh, national agricultural research systems. Mm -hmm. And so you need to partner there as well. There's a lot of great research from academia. We can't ignore that. And it's very foundational to driving new solutions for smallholders, which are often ignored by private enterprise. So the, 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 uh, the partnership mentality is to bring everyone together for these urgent problems, but also to humbly, patiently invest the time to understand the smallholder farmer context. The worst we can do is to come with our own preconceived notions, develop products, and either expect enthusiastic uptake by people who we haven't engaged with, or try to push technology on people. It never works. It doesn't work with smallholders, but it doesn't work with consumers either. Right. Uh, if, you, if it's not, if you, there's not good user research and users involved and the customers involved in the process, products fail from what, telecommunications to consumer goods. I mean, that's part of the strategy of tomorrow now is really to bring the voice of the farmer into the product. Um, our technology partner tomorrow.io has phenomenal uh, technologies, but at the end of the day, they're not ever going to ha reach their full potential um, and impact the farmers unless we are listening and learning from the farmers and, and having them tell us how they would want to use those products and, and services. I'd love to share with the audience a little more on Osiris, the project that we've just launched together. You know, what was your vision for Osiris and, and the partnership with, with Tomorrow Now? And so the, the fundamentals of the project are, are really around the critical nature of weather intelligence and weather data for everything, right? So I work in the agricultural development portfolio at the Gates Foundation. The data from tomorrow.io and the intelligence it can derive is equally valuable for malaria, for global health, for child and maternal health. It, it's, it's fundamental data for climate change. So it's, it's and generally, uh, you know, meteorological services are, are uh, could, could go a long way on the continent. 
And so in some ways, this comparative advantage of the Gates Foundation is building some of these foundational layers that benefit everyone, private enterprises, government agencies, academics, small and medium sized enterprises. And the farmers directly can take advantage of a, the change from a once a week, static, large grid prediction to a very, a very localized daily, fo daily forecast that meets their needs and speaks to their reality. Um, and you know, things like precipitation, uh, rainfall are highly variable, right? Anyone who, who's gonna go for a walk or plan an outdoor event knows that, you know, uh, two, two kilometers away, it may be raining and it's not raining here. And so um, that, those challenges plague high income countries, right? It's really hard to predict rainfall. Mm -hmm. And as for crops, that can make all the difference, right? So I started my career in, in drought tolerant maize and a few millimeters of rainfall at the right time can make or break a crop. And that's absolutely and even more true in this, in this scenario. And so to understand and get as much knowledge we can about uh, you know, heat, rainfall patterns, how those will impact different locations, and then use that knowledge. Osiris is specifically focused on the seed product development pipeline mm -hmm. and having better weather intelligence throughout the breeding process all the way through developing new seed varieties for, for farmers to grow. But I think the larger, the larger vision is to build a weather intelligence layer that's available at, at a reasonable cost as a global public good for multiple, you know, multiple players in, in the value chain to take advantage of. Yeah, and we heard from, from the farmers during our field visits the importance of choosing the right seed, right? But also uh, planting at the right time and the impact and the, the challenges of not having that reliable uh, and location-based data. Um, are there any stories that uh, you uh, can remember or for, that, that resonated with you from, from the field? And so one of the, one of the farmers in the farmer cooperative we talked to spoke specifically to the, the duration of the rainy season and how much rain they were going to get and crop choice, right? So it's a maize in a rainy, in a, in a good rainy season versus a sorghum choice in a, in a shortened season. Uh, you know, different intercropping and cropping systems, right? So we saw in the field, right, uh, dry beans, common beans inter, interspersed with pigeon pea. They have a lot of choices. That's actually the strength of the smallholder farmers. They can modify and, and fine tune their cropping system year to year based on, based on the, the, the scenarios without predictive tools to help them. It's a guess and it's a huge risk. In a high income country, highly industrialized agriculture, you actually don't have that much choice, right? In the Midwest, it's soy versus corn, that's it. And you have some varietal choice, but with huge scale comes some lack of agility. Once again, I think try, thinking positively about what strengths do the smallholder farmers have, what can they do? Mm -hmm. And then what, how a technology to derive for high income countries needs to be adapted and adopted so that farmers can take most advantage of the, the opportunities ahead of themselves. And so that, that space of crop selection, intercropping, um, changes in planting date uh, to, to take advantage of the seasonal changes is huge. Yeah. Without weather data, you don't know. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's a roll of the dice and best luck. When, when we met with this farmer cooperative, the infrastructure they had built was water collection, water capture from roof runoff. So we actually have a huge system of that in Seattle too. So I, I, enter, uh, I, I understood and, uh, and appreciated immediately. That said, of course, for Seattle, it's watering my, you know, my vegetable garden, it's a little less important. For them, it was huge because it made the difference between uh, a successful crop and, and a failure. And so they were very keen on understanding, for example, if I knew it was, was going to rain this week, would I turn on or off the water storage tank to irrigate my crop? That's a big decision. And as I said, could, could have all the difference in the world if they were able to then maintain some of that storage for later in the season when it stopped raining or when 
they had other challenges. So that's their insurance. Yeah. And so if they know how to better manage that resource, then they can decrease their own risk. And that's what, every, that's what we need to do for climate adaptation. So one of the stories that we had heard was just, if I knew it was going to rain, I would spend the time to go home, set up a water collection system so I could capture that rain. Mm -hmm. If I I'd literally just put a bucket, put, put a bucket and, under the yeah. spigot. And if, if I, if I didn't think it was going to rain, I wouldn't invest my valuable time to go home and do that where I could be doing something more, you know, something also important, go, go to town to collect supplies or to go, you know, to accompany my child to school. And so the farmer's time is extremely valuable and extremely limited. That's probably the most limited resource. Many small farmers also have side jobs. And so the balance of where to invest, when to invest this critical time in your farming operations uh, is really important. And everyone knows, you know, we use, we use weather data all the time to make decisions in our lives. We take for granted how, how weather data is used in our daily lives, how we make our own decisions, and what it would be like if we just didn't know. Uh, and, you know, smallholder farmers, it's a much more important decision. And therefore, these, it's just a fundamental, it's a fundamental data layer they need. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting that even in its rawest form can be valuable and work with the farmers let, and also let the farmers drive the value. They know their operations, they know what's going on, they have, they know also their limitations and constraints. We don't need to solve the problem for them, we need to pro provide them with the tools that they can empower them to take advantage of and manage their operations. Right, and that, that's what the Tomorrow Now strategy is all about. It's what can we do now, today, to connect farmers to existing technologies that um, can help them. But also, clearly there's transformation that we need to drive for tomorrow, and that's where the kind of systems change and sustainability yep. piece um, comes in. And the reality of is that, and many of the op the opportunities from the Gates Foundation's perspective do reside with the open market, yeah. right? It's a great way to have a sustainable model where some people are paying to support the the the, the free use of the tool. And so it's it's hard, especially where smallholder farmers they can't pay. I mean, they often can't support the tool themselves even if it's extremely valuable for them. So it, that's once again, a whole nother space of innovation about business model, about sustainability, about funding approaches. How do we keep this light? How do we keep it moving fast? Uh, and, and think through the long term because climate change is going to be with us. It's going to get worse. So we need to get these things in place and then we need to find mechanisms to keep them going. So that the worst case scenario is we develop a valuable solution for our farmer, give it to them for five years, and then it disappears. Right. And they start to rely on it for, for their livelihoods. Right. That can't happen. Yeah, and it's one of the reasons why we believe that leveraging phila philanthropy now makes a lot of sense. But over time, we need to figure out more sustainable ways of funding yeah. this in the long term. Yeah, and it's hard. It's, it's also part of what makes it so exciting is that we need to and approach things in totally new ways. And this that openness, trust, willingness to listen, and curiosity, really, that, that, that's what I think what are the key aspects of what will drive success here. For sure. I want to bring it back to the, the, the big picture to close. COP27 is, is coming up at the end of the year. What is the agenda that we need to push at COP27. There's been a lot of work on mitigation and there's a lot of energy in mitigation and par partially because there, you know, high income countries have a stake in it. It is a great, you know, green economy op uh, mm -hmm. opportunity for them. Uh, middle income countries as well. So lots of people are playing in that space. There's a lot of investment for good reason and we need it. We need it now. Adaptation, where there's less of a profit to be made, it's impacting the people who didn't build, make the problem, it's much harder and there's much less funding. It's a huge, it's, it's a huge oversight and 
it's a shame that not enough money is going into adaptation. Mm -hmm. And it's, there's a moral imperative to, to put, more, put more time, energy, and investment there. That's the fantastic part of the Gates Foundation is that we can focus on where others aren't playing. We have significant capital to invest. And so I think that bringing that agenda back to areas where it's not in the interest per se of cur you know, current and high income countries, but focusing on what is really necessary for people, the people impacted, their daily lives are already impacted. It's not a theoretical construct. It's a daily problem and we need to invest. We, ha we have to invest now. And so I, I'd like to see, especially as COP27 comes to Africa, that we think on these things more, more carefully and that we move beyond promises and thoughts and platitudes to action. That, so there's our call to action, right? It's the, the time for climate adaptation and action is right now. So let's make it happen. <laughs> so thank you so much, Neil, for uh, the conversation and for your insights. We're incredibly excited uh, to be working with you on this critical agenda. Um, we've got a lot of work to do, but it sounds like the, the most important thing is humility, right? yeah. to listen and to learn and to work better together. All right, that brings us to the end of day one of Climacon. We heard from some amazing speakers across the enterprise, tomorrownow.org, and it was an incredibly inspiring day. Stay tuned for tomorrow as we shift gears and we'll be talking about government, federal, and all things space. See you tomorrow. Most people are realizing what we've always known about space, which is that it is a multidisciplinary phenomenon. All this great innovation that's happening is in the private sector. And you're seeing it like none other than in space. We're looking at the entire value chain and saying, how can we solve each of the pieces independently to make the whole much better? What are the impacts of adaptation and mitigation strategies that we can take? And how does that interact back with the models? So the applications for radar are absolutely huge. You can kind of play around with and look at in a visualization sense. And it was always my dream to develop um, an, an even more robust real-time constellation. And when I saw that tomorrow I.O. was planning to do that, I thought, why not join them? I mean, we use the vantage point of space to understand Earth, to improve life on Earth. In a thousand years, people will be reading about what we do in space in the next decade or so. And so I invite you to join us on this journey.